Okay, welcome back to the Tehillim Shir, and uh, I hope that we'll be on track from now until Be'ez Hashem, till the end of the, the end of the season, which is somewhere around the month of Av, with, with around Tisha B'Av time. So we're starting back again after Pesach, and we're picking up in a brand new Tehillim today, which is number Samech Dalit 64. It's a short one, it has a very pertinent and very important message for us. And uh, we're going to try to cover the ground today, Be'ez Hashem. So in Rabbi Foyer's introduction to this Tehillim, he points out that there really is somewhat of a machlek, is somewhat of a discussion amongst the commentators of what exactly David HaMelech is referring to. And he goes with the opinion of Rashi and others who said that this is like a very prophetic Tehillim that David is saying. He himself is coming off the last one where he's in exile, he's in Gullis, running away once again, physically isolated, and yet spiritually, as we know, David HaMelech, all of his life, it doesn't matter where he is and what is going on, he is completely absorbed in serving HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And this total concentration that David has, wherever he is, whatever is going on, allows him to be oblivious to his enemies, the threats, and the danger that he's in. So the Midrash, which Rashi himself is explaining over here, points out that this Nevoa, this prophetic uh, vision, I guess we'll say, that David had, that he writes about here, is referring to a much later ancestor of David HaMelech, whose name was Daniel. Daniel, everybody knows the famous story when he was thrown into the lion's den. And the lions, instead of coming and devouring him, they ended up licking and kissing him, and he was unscathed. And the Rashi writes over here that this Tehillim is a premonition of what is going to happen with one of the descendants of David HaMelech, Daniel, who will find himself in a similar situation in his life where the enemies will be threatening him. And there was a decree at that time that nobody was allowed to talk to God. And Daniel said, maybe nobody is going to, but I'm going to. No one's going to tell me what to do. And they were warned that if you do, you'll be thrown into the lion's den and you will be killed. And he said, so be it. So I'll be thrown into the lion's den and I will be killed. And just as David HaMelech, time and time again, was saved from his enemies, saved from destruction, saved from obliter- being obliterated, so too Daniel, in the moment when they said, you can't pray to God, you can't address HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he continued to address Hashem. He continued to call out and to daven to HaKadosh Baruch Hu three times a day as they said you cannot do. And therefore, even in the, in the lion's pit, nothing could take Daniel away from his Avedis Hashem, his, servant of, of his service of God. And just as David was absorbed in his great love and his desire to be close to Hashem, so his descendant years later, Daniel, would be, find himself in the same place, utilizing the same... Uh, bravery, so to, speak, so to speak, spiritual bravery of David HaMelech. And that's... Yeah. yeah, so, they, so the Mephoshim over here, they bring down, I forget where I saw it, but they bring down the chain of, of, um, of descendancy, I guess, of the descendants to show that Daniel comes from the chain of David HaMelech. Now, that being said, that's one way to learn this Tehillim. But Rav Hirsch and the Malbim, they take a different approach in this Tehillim. And we'll start with Rav Hirsch, and the Malbim will, will complement what's being said over here. And Rav Hirsch writes that if you look carefully at the words of our Tehillim, we will find that this is a Tehillim that is speaking all about the evil sin of Lush and Hara which is very pertinent. Just two weeks ago, we had Parshas, Tazria, and Mitzora, And we, we always try to be mechazik ourselves, strengthen ourselves during that Parsha to have an insight and accept upon ourselves new ways that we are going to work on our Lashon Hara. I know many of the schools put out, the girls' schools put out the Machsem Lefi, which is a person takes upon themselves an hour every day where they where they commit themselves to machsam, sealing off their mouth, that they shouldn't speak Lashon Har. 
So many people, they choose like odd hours of the day, like three, or t- 3 in the morning to 4 in the morning, where they're sleeping, they have nothing to worry about. They're not going to say a word of Lashon Hara. But in the girls' schools, in the Beis Yaakov's, they made an initiative that they're going to make the machsam the feed during the hardest time of the day, lunchtime. Lunchtime is Lashon Hara time. That's what lunchtime is for. It's to eat, it's to see your friends, and to speak all the juicy Lashon Hara that you want to. And there's certain places I know in the yard over there in Beis Yaakov, you can see when the girls are sitting in that place, in that corner, right over there, huddled around and they're looking, that is Lush and Har essential. Now I'm probably speaking Lush and Har about the school right now, but I don't want to say that. But so all the, all the Beis Yaakovs around the country, even around the world, they, they got international, they took on a mach semlefi to seal their mouths during lunchtime, so that they should control the amount of Lashon Har that is being said, which is a valiant, a very valiant um, endeavor. I wish them a lot of Hatzlacha, because they will certainly need it to be able to guard their tongues from speaking Lashon Hara during the famous lunchtime hours. But that being said, Rav Hirsch writes that this whole Tehillim is really about the ills of Lashon Hara and what it could create, and people that will stick to their guns and not get drawn into that world, Sa'akodesh Baruch will take very good care of them. So, David, this is a, 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 a Tehillim to the one who grants victory. That's talking about HaKodesh Baruch, obviously. And Rav Hirsch writes like this. Really, it's referring to David who's surrounded by Shaul. That's what we had in the last Tehillim. And they are slandering David HaMelech. They're telling stories about him. People are telling Shalom Melech, David did this, he did this. They're fanning the hatred that Shalom Melech has, his father-in-law has, of his son-in-law David. So therefore he says that this Tehillim number 64 that we're in right now is portraying the impudence of the word of slander in all its dangerous connotations. Lashin Hara is wicked, it is dangerous, it could destroy people, it could destroy families, it could destroy worlds. And therefore, we're going to speak about that, but at the same time, it proclaims with confidence that all slanderers will eventually perish by their own, and this is a fancy word that he uses, calumny. For those of you who don't know what calumny is, I had to check the dictionary. It's a fancy word for slander, which means that if in fact, you will end up slandering others and you will speak Lashon Hara and your mouth becomes just a, a rattling box of Lashon Hara that hurts and puts other people down. Eventually, as we'll see in this Tehillim, you will perish from the same thing itself. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, it's not like your words are hidden from Hashem. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Gemara tells us that at the end of a person's life, after 120 years, a person will be told what his conversation was. And the Gemara says over there, even the smallest little conversation that a person had between a husband and a wife, that is going to be stored away for all of posterity's sake. Hashem will remind you and replay it. Certainly the Lash and Hara that a person spoke in this world, you'll never escape it. Now maybe people didn't hear it. Maybe nobody knows that it was you that said it. Maybe nobody realizes because of you, they lost their job, they didn't get the shirach, they didn't get, the, they didn't get what they wanted. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu knows and he's holding on. And therefore people who are slanderers, they will eventually perish in their own slander. Shema Elohim Kaili. So he says, hear my voice Hashem. Besichi when I'm praying, mi pachad oyev titzar chayai. My, I'm, when I'm praying to preserve my life from the fear of my enemies. Says Rav Hirsch, preserve my life from the fear of my enemies. Not just preserve my life from the enemies themselves, meaning that it's natural that a person who sees the enemy coming their way, he sees things, you know, it's like when you're in a room and suddenly there's like this gigantic bee buzzing around. You're not just asking HaKadosh Baruch Hu, don't let the bee sting me. But you're suddenly, you're anxious, you're fearful, you're worried about things. David is asking, let me have 
a let me be let my life be preserved from the fear that I have of my enemies. Let me attain the exaltation which will raise me high above any fear of the enemy and will preserve my life. Meaning when a person has the amun and bitachin, when they trust in the Rebbeinah Sha'ilam, that HaKadosh Baruch is the one that is pulling all the strings in this world, and HaKadosh Baruch is deciding how everything is going to turn out, and I realize that nobody could lay a finger on me unless HaKadosh Baruch wants them to lay a finger on me, so then I'm not fearful, I'm not afraid of another person, I only fear HaKadosh Baruch And therefore David, it's uh, again, in the self-effacing humility, humility of David HaMelech, he, he, he expresses that he's a human being, although that he's more malach, more angel than mortal human being, but at the same time, even he is subject to the fears of the enemies that are coming his way. So he's davening to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, listen to my tefillahs, to my prayers, that I should be elevated above the worries and the concerns and the fear of my enemy, and that my spiritual and moral vigor will be unbent and unbowed in the midst of all the dangers that may be set me. If I'm worried, when a person is worried, their mind is all over the place, they cannot focus in on what they want to do. It's very hard to be ruchni, as to be spiritual, to feel connected to the Rebbe Nishalam, to have menuchas hanefesh, to have peace of mind when your mind is filled with the worries and the fears of what is going on around you. And therefore, David Melch is saying, I'm being chased down by the enemy. My father-in-law is here in words of Lashon Har, it's fanning the fuel over here, the fires. He hates me now even more. He's coming, he's coming after me. But if, if I get caught up in that act, says David HaMelech, and I start worrying so much about what's going to happen to me, what's going to be, what's he going to be able to do, how am I going to daven? How am I going to pray? How am I going to think about you, Hashem? How am I going to stay calm under the, under the circumstances? How am I going to be able to learn you? To, how will I be able to do that? And therefore he asked HaKadosh Baruch Hu, just lift me up above the natural inertia or the state of a man, which is to worry about these things in order that I should be able to continue staying close to you and serving you in the right way. Now, Rav Hirsch, he puts the next three verses together. We'll see him and then we'll go, I think we'll see at this point, we'll go to the, we'll go to the Malbim. Pastireini mi said mireim merig shas payale oven. You alone can hide me from the secret counsel of the evildoers, from the tumult of the workers of violence. Verse Dalit number four, Asher shanunu kecherif. They sharpen their, l'shoinim, they sharpen their tongues like swords. Darchu chitzim davrema, and they aim their bitter word at me like arrows. So they're sharpening their tongue like swords, and they're aiming their words at me like arrows. And five, Lirais ba mistarim, tam pisam yeru v'lo yiro. They want to strike the blameless man in secret place. I didn't do anything wrong, says David HaMelech. They're making up stories with the Lashon Hara, and they're trying to strike him unaware, and they are not afraid. They are not afraid, because they are, they have all their, their, their power behind them. But I'm asking you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, keep me, keep me protected. So, Rav Hirsch says over the following idea, and that is that if, if someone is coming and chasing after a person, so then I know that this person is attacking me. So I have a chance then to defend myself. If I see the guy running towards me, we should never see such things, but if I see the guy running towards me, and he's screaming and yelling, Allah Akbar, whatever he's yelling, or I see a guy yelling, Jew, uh, I see a person running after me with a stick or something of that nature. Since I see the damage that is coming my way, if I, if I act fast enough and quick enough and I'm strong enough and I have enough siyat of the Shemaya, so I'll be able to protect myself from the attack that is coming in my direction. However, there's something called misayid mireyim. There is a plot that is laid in secret. On that I cannot protect myself. On that only HaKadosh Baruch can protect me. For example, we find by Bilam. Bilam was cursing the Jewish people. 
day and night. And Klal Yisrael was down in their tents, in their camps. They had no idea this deal that was taking place between Bullock and Bilaam, that Bilaam was there to curse Klal Yisrael. And he was trying to find that one moment in the day that HaKadosh Baruch gets angry at the Jewish people and he's going to allow the curse to take place. We're minding our own business. We're down in the Machine Yisrael, the camp of the Jewish people. We're doing our Avaida, we're running our lives, we're keeping things the way that they are. Bilaam's up there on the mountain looking down at us, cursing us. And yet HaKadosh Baruch Hu never allows that moment of anger to arise any of those days that Bilaam is up there. So Bilaam is in the mistarim, in the secret, in the, in the plotting ways he's coming to attack us. Only that HaKadosh Baruch can say, we have nothing to do with that. Now a plot which is as explained below, we're, we're going to see over here what is the plotting that we're talking about. It's carried out by the deadly weapon of Lashon Hara. Lashon Hara is a plot that is laid in secret. You cannot see the Lashon Hara when it is being spoken. You most likely don't hear the Lashon Hara that is being spoken. Someone is behind the scenes saying nasty things about you, hurting and damaging your reputation, tarnishing your life. And therefore, the Lashon Hara that, that we are referring to, the plan and the counsel of the evildoers that David is referring to, who are sharpening their tongues like a sword, and they're aiming their words like an arrow, that's those people that speak Lashon Hara about somebody else. And so David HaMelech is saying, only you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, can protect me from the sin of Lashon Hara that other people are saying about me. Now the Malbin writes over here the following. It says, Asher shonimu l'shonim kecherev, they sharpen their tongues like a sword. Ha'oreges mikarev, that's referring to someone that tries to come and kill you close up. A sword is only going to get so far. The guy's got to have it in his hand and he's going to lash out with you. Nechein darche chitzim bedavramar. However, the way of the arrows... For the bitter word, says, says the Malbim, Shua Eris Shemaishim Bayesachets. The soldiers, when they used to go out to battle, they used to, uh, they used to um, smear poison on the heads of the arrows so that when they would shoot it out across the field and try to strike the enemy, the enemy, even if he didn't get hit so terribly by the arrow, but there was poison in there, the poison would go in and it could kill them. An arrow can kill far away. Remember this, this imagery that he's saying. The sword that they have in their hands, that's only something that's going to kill very close. But the arrow, that can go far away and it can kill. Those people who speak such nasty words and they're malshin, they, they, they defame me and they disgrace me. They say terrible things about me. They do it secretly. Like this arrow, which shows that they are shooting from afar. And this he's saying is the imagery, the, the mushal, the parable of what Lashon Hara is. There are enemies that are close up. You can see them. They're carrying swords. They're wielding swords. They're going to try to get you. But the person who's speaking Lashon Hara, he sharpens his tongue in order to be able to spew out the words from afar of Lashon Hara, like an arrow that is smeared with the, with the poison on top. It goes... Shoo, strikes, the, strikes its, its target and can end up destroying a person. Lashon Hara is so bad and it is so evil that even from far away you can cause damage and destruction. A knight in shining armor with his sword can only kill the people that are in front of him. Maybe now we have missiles that they can go hundreds of miles perhaps and blow something up. But Lashon Hara, especially in our day and age, with the advent of social media and, and, and phone and texting and WhatsApping and, and emails, it can travel thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of miles in the press of a button and can destroy 
a person just like that. I remember there was the Chavetz Chaim Heritage Foundation, one year Tisha B'Av, they made this whole video before they showed the speeches. And it was all about how there was a, a Rebbe in a, in a high school who was doing a favor for an old woman who wasn't able to go to the store. And she'd asked them for very expensive meat from the store. She wanted like rack of lamb for Yom Tov that was coming up. So you see the Rebbe waiting in line at the butcher shop, and he's, he asked them for the, rack of, for the rack of lamb, which is whatever it is, $30 a pound. And while he's getting it and paying for it, he's a Rebbe, so he's supposed to be a poor man. So what's he doing? Is he, he's like embezzling money? He's, 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 he's stealing, where does he get the money for a rack of lamb? So there's somebody standing in line, and they see him, and they type on their phone immediately, what says, can you believe it? Rabbi Rosenberg is buying rack of lamb for Yom Tiv? Where does he have such money from? And then this person sent it out to this one, and this and this, and the next thing you know, there's emails that are flying. And by the time that the Rebbe walks into school on Monday morning, the principal calls him and says, what's going on? You're spending so much money on food? Where are you cutting out this money from? And the man's reputation was destroyed over doing a chesed for an old lady who could not go to the store to buy her rack of lamb before Yom Tov. Says David HaMelech over here, do you understand how powerful and how divisive and how long-reaching the words of Lashon Hara are? It's not a cherv, it's not a sword. The words of Lashon Hara in this Pasuk are likened to an arrow. An arrow you pull back, whoosh, you shoot it very, very far away, and therefore it's destructive beyond belief. Lirais, the Pasuk says over here, in order to strike, Shedar Chuchitzim Lirais, um, the way of arrows is to strike as as atam be mistam shelo yira isav lo yishma mipnehem. The way of an arrow is someone who's walking around aimlessly. He's just walking around. He doesn't see what's going on, and the arrow comes out of nowhere and can strike him. That's the words of lashonar, and that's what he says. The words of lashonar is such a thing that they can strike a person pisa in, a, in an instant without him being aware of it, and it can end up destroying such a person. So the words of Lashon Hara will go out, and they will strike, not some, necessarily they will strike me right away, they get other people involved in those words of Lashon Hara. You, de- you begin to develop the whole chever, the whole group, Bali Lashon Hara, people that are speaking Lashon Hara, and those things itself will end up causing a tremendous damage to the person that they are defaming with their words of Lashon Hara. Says, um, yeah, says the Mitsudas David on this word, uh, on these words about the, the arrow, hechinu l'shanim kechets, they prepare their, la- their tongues like an arrow. Hamusam ala keshes be'is hadricho, just like the arrow is on the bow and it's being pulled back. Now the stronger you pull back that bow, the farther the arrow is going to be able to be shot. Someone who is very well versed in the world of Lashon Hara, who knows what to say and how to say it, he's pulling back on that bow as hard as he possibly can, and the harder he pulls on the bow, the, f- the longer the range is going to be of that Lashon Hara. And that's why the Chavetz Chaim famously said, it's nearly impossible that a person will ever be able to do tshuva in the right way for the words of Lashon Hara that they say, because you have no idea how far the reach of your Lashon Hara is, even in the days of the Chavetz Chaim, where there was no social media. They were barely, I didn't even know if there were telephones back then. So how did the words get around? Because the Gemara says, Chavr de Chavr, Isle people speak amongst themselves. You hear it in the shuk in the marketplace, you hear it in the store, you hear it in the mikvah, you hear it over here. One guy says this, one woman says this, the girls, the ladies are sitting around spinning their threads and they start talking about this and that. And the next thing you know, the whole town is on fire with the words of Lashon That's why the Chavetz Chaim wrote his famous Sefer Chavetz Chaim, because he saw in his generation, nobody understood the severity of Lashon Hara. They didn't realize how, how divisive it was and how it was destroying the world. And they didn't know the halachas. They didn't know the laws. You could have all the, 
all of the concern and all of the fear of saying words of Lashon Har, but if you don't know what the Halach is, then you're going to say Lashon Har no matter what. And therefore, says the Mitzudas David, based on these words of David and Melech Ovi, how careful a person must be when they are pulling back the bow with the arrow that has poison on the tip, because those words of Lashon Har can be destructive. Going further, says uh, in verse number 6, Yechasku lomai davara, they think the evil word is strong. They lay hidden snares as they tell and they say, who would see them? Says Rav Hirsch, they, per- they persuade themselves that the evil word is the strongest and surest weapon. Someone who's, these people that are trying to defame David Melech, they believe that the Lush and Hara is the strongest thing in the world. And therefore, they don't commit direct or overt even Lush and Hara, but they skillfully wield, wield the word of slander. That's also, that's people that are crafty in Lush and Hara is even worse. If a guy just speaks Lashon Hara outright, okay, everybody understands, he's speaking Lashon Hara. So if you're sensitive to Lashon Hara, so then you know this guy's speaking gossip and uh, gossip mongers, stay away. But very often, people that are in the world of Lashon Hara, they're very crafty about the way in which they say it over. They don't want you to understand right away that what they're saying is full-fledged, derisive Torah prohibition Lashon Hara. They do it in a way that is under the radar. They're covert in what they say in order that it will look like it's a harmless conversation that we're having. As they tell that they secretly set the snare in the minds of the listeners to entrap their enemy. Meaning, he knows very well what he's saying, but he doesn't want you to know what he's saying. He knows very well his agenda is coming to undermine this particular person. But they just say like, Oh, a little tiny statement, a little, a little quip, an off-the-cuff kind of a thing. They don't mean anything bad about it, but they end up dropping already that idea into your head. And then they come back again, and they say another thing, and they drop another idea. And then what ends up happening is you usually see the person that they already said these words of Lush and Hara about, the person that you respect, the person you look up to, and then you see them do something. And you see them do something that seems to look exactly what it was that this person was dropping this confusing uh, doubt into your head. And then you say, oh, you know what, I think that they're right. Or the guy says something to you, and you say, you know what, I always thought there was something wrong with that person. That's how it I, I knew this. I knew there's something not right about them. This person, if you'll, if you'll put them in a court of law, Lashon, not me. I didn't speak Lashon Hara. I didn't say anything. I was not having a friendly conversation. I said a little thing over here. He's going now. I'm going to hate this person because I didn't say anything. And therefore the Bali Lashon Hara, those people that are skilled at this, they know exactly how to say it. You'll never be aware what they're saying is so bad, but it starts infusing the doubt into one's head. Says, that's, okay, that's Pasig Vav. Pasik Zion. Yechamsu Oilois Tamnu. They investigate these iniquities. Chefes Mechupas Vekerev Ish Velev Amaik. We shall be here no more when a search is made for the man is within and the heart is deep. What does this mean? So he writes uh, along these lines again. It's possible to detect and investigate overt acts of criminality. Someone is out there doing terrible things. You can see what they're doing. The guy goes and he, and, he, and he steals cars. He robs people in their homes. He punches people. He hurts people. Okay, we can see it. But the slanderous word that has set the snare is long since said and gone from the minds of men when the crime incited has been committed and is about to be investigated. It's like this thing. I don't know what it's called. Snapchat. You can... One of the evil um, apps of social media, I, I think this one that I'm describing is called Snapchat. How does it work? 
You have no accountability for yourself ever because you can send out the nastiest words and message, lewd pictures and, and racy pictures and, and incriminating pictures. You send it out and the moment that the person opens it up, he basically has, I don't know what it is, like 30 seconds to be able to read and to see the picture and then it disintegrates into thin air and you never see it again. And there's a, a lock, like a block on the phone that it's, you cannot take a screenshot of that which is there. So how does it work? You could say terrible, nasty things to another person. You could send pictures that are incriminating to a person to scare them. This is like the cyber bullying that we're talking about. And it disappears and nobody can ever prove that you did such a thing. Says Rav Hirsch, that's Lush and Hara. Lush and Hara is, I could say the words in this room today about someone that's somewhere else. I could begin to destroy their reputation in the eyes of whoever it is that I spoke to over here. They then in turn will go elsewhere and elsewhere and elsewhere. But my words were said, nobody can ever actually trace. The, they come out of my mouth, they're gone. They disappear into thin air. They're gone. So my words are dangerous. My words can be lethal, but the lethal words that I have, nobody could ever pin it back on me. And even the one who originally uttered the word, should he be found out? Let's say that they get me. They, all the people say, well, he's the one who said it. If it wasn't us, it was him. I could readily, this person could prove that his remarks were quite innocent. Lashonara? Me? I would never say Lashonara. That's not what I meant. That's how they understood me. When I said that this person is a lazy bum, they must not have understood what I was saying. I was trying to say that he just, you know, he, he doesn't do things as fast as... Ever. I don't know what they understood. When I was saying it, somebody asked me, should I get involved in business with this person? When I said, you know, look, if I were you, I would try to go to another person for business. Well, I wasn't speaking Lashon Hara. Why didn't they understand what I was saying? So I could always defend myself that the people that were listening to me totally misunderstood what I was saying, and that's why they accused me of Lashon Hara, but I didn't. So if that's the case, says of Hirsch, who is going to be able to detect the evil intention which makes such a speech a crime? Nobody. Nobody will be able to hear from my mouth. Nobody heard it. Now, again, we live in a different world. We live in a world of recordings. We live in a world of everybody, you go someplace, something's happening, people pull out their videos right away. They're recording the video or they're recording the audio. So maybe I could do, you know, slow motion replay over here, listen to the words. How do you tell me that that was not Lashon Hara when you said that this person, and you used all the explicative that you want to tell me that this is a horrible person? How can you deny that that's Lashon Hara? But even still, in the crazy world that we live in, since you can't accuse anybody of doing anything so wrong, so he'll still be able to answer, answer, answer for himself and be able to try to wiggle himself out of such a thing. And he says, the spirit which is man is within and the heart is deep, which means they are impenetrable and undiscernible to the human eye. What I really was thinking when I said those words, nobody knows besides HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Nobody knows. So even if you want to accuse me of what I said was Lashon Hara, I'll tell you, you don't know what's going on inside of me. I, wasn't, I didn't mean that at all, and therefore it can never <clears throat> be pinned back to the person themselves. Says the Malbim, Mechamsin lahare sha'asa avel kedei latzig ma'asehim. So what do Bali Lashonara, what do people do who speak Lashonara? They try to prove that this person that they're talking about did a terrible thing in order to make my words righteous, my words correct. Shereitzim la'atzig sh'david chayav misa. Those that were coming and telling Shalom Melech that was such a terrible person, they were trying to show Shaul, the father-in-law of David, look at all these terrible things that he did. Why? Because if we can prove that he did terrible things, then we are justified in saying what we're saying, that David deserves the, the death penalty. They looked everywhere they could. 
And therefore they couldn't, and they couldn't find any revealed sin of David and Melech. They started saying, maybe did this, maybe this. No, we can't find anything. So therefore, Bekev Ish Ubelev Amok, in the innermost recesses of the person, what did they say? Yechav Su'alav Oila Bekev Libai. They said, you know what, fine. David and Melech's actions, we can't bring him to a court of law and prove him guilty of anything. But what was really going on in David's heart and mind when he did that thing? What was his real intention when he acted like this and he acted like What was the real intention? And therefore, they begin to say, let's go deeper into the world, the consciousness of David and Melchor, the subconsciousness. They say, you know what, David really at the core is a wicked person. He's really a bad person. So they couldn't bring any proofs to, to show HaMelech that David is such a bad person. So what do they end up doing with their slander? They said, you're right, you know what, David on the outside, he looks like a big tzaddik. That's the way that all, that's the way that all, uh, all tricksters are. But on the inside, David and Melch has all these ulterior motives, all these bad ideas, all these plans that he's trying to bring to fruition. Shaul, you have to be careful of this person over here. And then it goes on, V'yorim Elohim hates peace hayyum ha'kaisam. However, <clears throat> after they tried to get David, what happened? Hashem ended up smiting them, and a sudden arrow to their blows came to be. What, is, what does that mean? Says, says Rav Hirsch, these people who felt so safe, they were using the missiles that were wrought by their tongues. They were just shooting out one word of lesson after another, because no earthly judge could compel them to go before the tribunal on such grounds. Nobody could tell them, oh, you have to come to court right now, we're going to try you. So what ends up happening? HaKadosh Baruch Hu's arrow is the one that comes and smites them. Like we said in the beginning, though in the, at the end of this Tehillim, which we're almost holding by the end over here, we're going to come to see that the Lashon Hara that people speak will come back to bite them in the end. You try to destroy somebody else with your words of Lashon Hara, HaKadosh Baruch even though nobody else knows perhaps that you are saying verified words of Lashon Hara, HaKadosh Baruch knows very well what you are saying, and he will turn the arrows that you, that you send out against that person, he will turn them back on you. Says the Ma'abim, um, yeah, aval pisaim yoria elokim aleim chetz, but unexpectedly, HaKadosh Baruch is going to turn the arrow back on them, and hayu ma'kaisim v'azolam sh'amayikshim she'echinu al David, these traps, that they laid for David and Melech, heim atzmam hayu ha'makeh shalahem shabam hukai. Exactly in the thing that they tried to trap David and Melech in, in that they themselves are going to be, they're going to be subjected to also. Umefarash kik, and that's, and that's what it means. Meaning, you're trying to speak Lashon about David and Melech, you're trying to put David and Melech down, you're trying to destroy him with your words of slander. Exactly in the things that you're saying, it's going to turn around on you and it's going to come back to bite you and the, the arrows with the poison on the tip is going to come and strike you and you'll get caught. <clears throat> and that's what he's saying will happen to those people who speak Lashon Hara. Those people that speak Lashon Hara on a regular basis hurt people and try to hide their real intentions. So at the end of the day, it all comes back to bite the person and they are going to get trapped in their own Lashon Hara. V'yachshilu aleimai l'shoinam they made their own tongue a stumbling block. They block unto themselves all those who look upon them feel moved. He puts these three verses together. Let all men uh, learn or fear. And they will see the handiwork of Hashem. And God understands what a person does. Yismach tzadik Hashem, the righteous will rejoice in Hashem, the chasabah, they will take refuge in Him, the yishalalu kal yishrei leiv, and let all of those upright in heart have glory. So what does this mean? So says, says Rav Hirsch the following, that when the, when, when the enemies that were attacking David HaMelech tried to destroy his his, his reputation and his honor, HaKadosh Baruch Hu came and he brought these blows upon them like a sudden arrow. 
meaning their own, the, the, the turn of their own tongues. He turned their own tongues into the very instrument that brings about their downfall. The poisonous arrow of their words rebounds upon them. And therefore it's quite clear that their downfall is an act of Hashem. Which means, I don't know exactly all the details of this story over here, but somehow those slanderers that tried to slander to Shaul about David HaMelech, and they were sending out their poisonous tongues of Lashon Hara, HaKadosh Baruch ended up turning everything around that they themselves are the ones that got destroyed. And the Malbim writes the following, Their tongues caused them to stumble and fall into their own traps. Through their own tongues, they got caught up in the traps that they tried to throw upon David HaMelech. And therefore, oh, that's, he, he brings a, he brings a example, Doeg had Doemi, Doeg, who was one of the people that was slandering to King, to King Shaul, he was killed, Al Yidei Lushonai, through his own mouth of things that he said ended up coming back to bite him, and he got killed as a result. So he's not to call Rayabam, Shekol Ro'ehem, all that will see him, will see them. They will say, when, they, when you will see a person who ends up falling to his own hands or his own tongue, everybody will say, it's their own tongue, the Lashonar, that they spoke that trapped them where they were. And says the Malbim, everybody will see, <coughs> they will see that the punishment came measure for measure. The Ayyadeh Zen, through that, Yagidu Pailalakim, Everybody will speak about the hand, the handiwork of Hashem. Shayidei Kenya Kiru. They will recognize Sha'an Sham Zebom Hashem that these punishments of these people came to Hashem. The Shayesh Hashkach Mishmar Hashem is watching everything in his judgment. Which means that a person who speaks Lashon Hara, they should never think they're going to get away with it. Because even if nobody else knows, or nobody else can, can, can accuse you, or nobody else can prove that you were speaking Lashon Hara. HaKadosh Baruch Hu knows very well everything that you said. He's an eye in Raya, he's an eye that sees, and an oiz in Shema'as. He is the ear that hears, and everything that a person does is being written down in his ledger, in his book. Which means every word that a person says is being, is being kept track of by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So every word of tefillah that you say, Hashem keeps track. Every good word of, of inspiration, of, of encouragement to somebody else, Hashem keeps track. Every bracha that you said, Hashem is keeping track. Every word of Lash and Hara, Hashem is also keeping track. And at the time that it is necessary or that a person deserves it, HaKadosh Baruch is going to take that Lash and Hara and he's going to turn it back on the person and they will end up being punished me the connected, me the measure for measure for that which they said about somebody else, HaKadosh Baruch will bring it back on them and everybody will begin to see that Hashem is the one that is running this world. Yismach tzadik ba'ashem The tzadik, the righteous, will rejoice in Hashem. Ki simcha le tzadik asayz mishpat When a tzadik sees justice in this world meted out, he rejoices because he's able to see HaKadosh Baruch Hu running the world in the right way. V'chasabai, they'll have pity on him, ki yirash Hashem ma'ishia chaysav. He sees that HaKadosh Baruch Hu redeems and he saves those that he has, that he has mercy on, those of the tzaddikim. V'yishhalu ko yishrei leiv, all of those that are up straight hearted or up, up, upstanding people will praise Hashem. V'mashim oydim es Hashem, those that serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu v'noishim bai, and they rely upon him, Ubishmai in his name, Yishalalu, they will end up, they end up revering and praising his name. Which means at the end of the day, if you go and you speak Lashon about somebody else, it will come back to bite you. You will not, in the end of the day, that if you're speaking especially badly about Sadiqim, at the end of the day, HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves Sadiqim, he doesn't like people that speak Lashon Hara. He loves the righteous, he, he, he enjoys them being close to him. So if you speak things badly about such a person, at the end, it will end up coming back to bite. There are countless frightening stories about those people who spoke badly about 
Rabbanim, about Sadiqim, about Khashiva people that were in this world. I just I just saw today. Maybe that's why it was there's a there's a there is a what do you call it? There's a, a Tehillim that they put out with anecdotes and stories of Rav Chaim Kanievsky. And very often it's 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 uh, anecdotal stories that try to fit into the into the Tehillim. So they told over in there the fa- the famous story about Rechaim Kanievsky that he was once writing a sefer about kosher grasshoppers. There's such a thing as a kosher grasshopper. Normally we don't eat insects, but the Torah says that there is a certain kind of grasshopper that is kosher. And he was in the midst of writing a commentary on the kosher grasshopper, and he was confused about a certain, uh, I guess. Uh, genealogical part of the of the grasshopper, exactly how it looked, and he didn't know he didn't know the pshat, he didn't understand exactly what was what he was reading, how to explain it. Suddenly, he's sitting at his desk by a window, and a grasshopper flies in from the window, and he looks, and lo and behold, it's exactly the grasshopper that he's talking about in the book that he's writing. And the grasshopper is like modeling for Rav Chaim Kanievsky exactly the part that he needed to see on the grasshopper's body so he would know how to explain it. Rav Chaim Kanievsky, who's not, he doesn't get, you know, shocked or anything. Rav Chaim runs the world. If you're doing what Hashem wants, Hashem will send you a grasshopper that's kosher. So he, he looks at the grasshopper, grasshopper sits still, and he's writing everything he needs to. When he finishes what he's writing, so basically Rav Chaim Kanievsky said his thank you and his goodbyes, and the grasshopper went away. He goes back to write, and he realized he forgot to look at one part of the grasshopper. And he thought to himself, boy, can I really use that grasshopper again? And lo and behold, the grasshopper flies right back into the windowsill. And he starts going through, and he writes everything exactly the way that he does. And it was a, it was a mifis. It's like a, a miraculous thing that a man in our generation, HaKadosh Baruch sends things like that. That's the sign of someone that is doing the will of Hashem. Hashem takes care of what he needs. So, to make a long story short, a man comes one day to Rav Chaim, this story went out like wildfire, people heard about the story, and it was another one of the stories of Rav Chaim Kanievsky in his lifetime of the levels, the greatness that he was on. So a man comes, I don't know what it was, several months later, several, whatever it was, comes to Rav Chaim Kanievsky, and he says, I came to ask Mechila, and he says, Mechila, for what would you have to ask me forgiveness for? He said, we were learning in yeshiva, we were learning about this, the, the kosher grasshopper, and my Magad Shir, my Rebbe, was so amazed by the story of, of Rav Chaim Kanievsky about the grasshopper flying into the window, he told over the story that we should know that in our generation such a man exists, that Hashem does His will and He sends the kosher grasshopper right to Him so He can write a safer. And I have to be honest with you, in my heart of heart, I scoffed the whole thing. Nah, I can't be, no such thing, this will never happen. I don't even think that the, that the man went and told anybody. He just, in his heart, he's like, Psh, impossible, such a thing can't be true. I don't believe it. He says, Rebbe, I came home today to my apartment, and my house is flooded in grasshoppers. <laughs> and I am sure that the reason that my house is flooded with grasshoppers is because of the lack of coven that I gave to you that I thought that the whole thing is a hoax. So I'm asking you, please, be meichel me, Rebbe. Please be meichel me. And Chaim Kanevsky said, you have nothing to worry about. I'll meichel you. Go home. There won't be any grasshoppers anymore. <laughs> and he left his house swarming with grasshoppers. He runs home to his apartment. He opens the door. Not a single grasshopper left in the room. Says David HaMelech in Tehillim, if you are going to speak slanderous Lashonar about other people, you should know that it's going to come back and bite you in one way, shape, or form. Because HaKadosh Baruch is aware of every word of every language that was used, of every lush and horror that was said. And it's like a, an arrow that goes out. Guess what? The winds will change and the arrows will come back and strike the person themselves. So we have to be exceedingly careful with the words that we say, besides the fact that lush and horror is an isa deraisa in the Torah, and there's like 31 
commandments that the Chavetz Chaim speaks about that revolve around the sin of speech, besides all of that, besides the fact that it destroys and everything like that, you have to know you're taking, you're taking your life in your own hands by doing such a thing. You're asking for HaKadosh Baruch to scrutinize your speech. You're asking him to examine you and hold on to your words of Lashon Hara. And when he's able to, he will redirect that arrow. And chas v'chalilu, who knows what kind of damage it can cause to, to the person themselves. So David was careful, and he never gave up his hope in HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And he said, don't slander me, but Hashem, I know you're the one that's in charge. You're taking care of it. And his enemies once again faded away. We should be zeicha that if chalila, we have any enemies of people that are saying their lashonar and speaking badly and the like about us, Hashem should turn the winds away from us and, and direct the arrows in the place where they belong. Because a person who's speaking lashonara, unfortunately, he's, he's not doing a very good thing and the punishments are waiting for such a person. Which means for us, we have to watch our mouths as well to make sure that we are not doing what, the wrong thing, that the arrows and the wind should be turned back on us. We have to speak in the right way and not in the wrong way. Rahmat al-Islam. Have a wonderful week. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. You're welcome. <laughs>